Yeah, hello? Hi, I don't need that. Let's see what I can do about that. Suddenly it's 1960. Yes, yes, that's my girlfriend's tapestry. We figured it would work. As the tapestry looks more like a tonka. Yeah, it's, uh, it's got the Ganesh up on there. Oh, I see, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's a pleasure. Where are you? I'm uh, in Boulder, Colorado right now. Yeah, but uh, recently deported myself to Austin, Texas. Oh, college stop to one college stop to another. Yeah, uh, yeah, about about that. Um, <laughs> Good luck in Texas. Thank you, thank you. Everything south of Princeton for me is the Bible Belt. Yeah, well, it uh, it puts the work that I'm trying to do in in uh, a more appreciated context. I feel more like a, an essential nutrient. Yeah, I have this this kind of thing about a, you know, the idea of kind of identifying as a blood cell, you know, carrying carrying the uh, nutrients to the necessary regions of the body, and it it allows me to kind of um, put my my own messianic pretensions in a larger context of service. And are you? Uh doing this scientifically, or is this just sort of new age? Uh, it's um, an attempt to uh, work my, my training in evolutionary biology and ecology through the arts and through, like, uh, entertainment, media, uh, doing shows and, and talks and stuff. It's, it's um, pretty woolly, and it, it hasn't really... It hasn't really grounded itself out in in a particular format, but but scientific literacy, uh, including literacy on the rhetoric of science, I feel like is is really important. So I've been doing a lot of art, art, music, and stuff, but it's yeah. mostly. Why do you find Boulder not a congenial environment for that. Um, Boulder is uh, is very small, and everyone. Um, it seems that most of the people here that I know uh, have a uh, feel like they've got it pretty well figured out already. You know, they're not they're not looking for outside sources of inspiration. So yeah, yeah, yeah that's a, that's a kind of inbred town between Naropa and, and the party school of uh, University of Colorado. When mm. I used to, when I was living in Creston, I would go up there when I was hungry for Mexican restaurants and bookstores and record stores. Those used to exist in those days. And um, so it was a nice break from uh, the hickey quality of the uh, San Luis Valley, which is pretty <laughs> cultural wasteland. Yeah. So this interview. Just yeah. Just you and me, why and what for? Okay. Mud Oregon or magazine. Or whatever. Right. So um, I'm interviewing you for uh, two websites. One is the renaissanceproject.com, which is uh, the work of my friend Michael Richardson, the one who introduced me to your work a couple of years ago. And he and I are working together with a, this international group of people to um, paint a portrait of multimedia creative work uh, going on all over the world in different cities. It's a t kind of... Uh, take a, a snapshot, uh, do like on the ground journalism for this this planetary creative renaissance from the inside, looking at people's spiritual stories, looking at their, um, you know, how they understand their relationship to their technology and their media uh, within this, you know, larger narrative of the crises of our time, et cetera. And then... And then the other website, and for, so for them, I've been doing um, kind of uh, overhead view essays looking at an attempt to, to try and feel out this new planetary cultural space from the inside. And then for this other website, this is uh, the Hybrid Reality Institute, which is a think tank out of London that's interested in the co-evolution of humankind with our technologies and they have a, a blog on big think um they've worked they uh, one of their fellows is this guy uh, richard doyle who 
is a, an information science professor, I think at Penn State, really interesting fellow, just wrote a book called Darwin's Pharmacy about the, uh, the evolution of human language in, co in context with uh, plants, sexual selection and stuff. But most of the guys that are working with hybrid reality are also, um, like a lot of them are associated with Singularity University and this whole rapture of the nerds thing. So I'm, I'm trying to do a, to trying to provide another perspective for them and their community because they're really interested in having a, uh, a bouquet of voices here. And I'm, I'm kind of uh, of the mind that we miss the singularity. Um, that it, you know, for, for all its substantive purposes, it already happened and is always already happening, so. Who created the phrase singular, uh, the rapture of the nerds? Is that Kevin Kelly? I don't know. I don't know, but it's a good one. Um, I, I know my son, Evan, used it, and I, uh, I'm not too sure if he created it or it was Kevin Kelly in the movie about uh, Kurt's file. Yeah. Because I saw the movie, which was actually pretty good. Um, it made me uh, more sympathetic with Kurzweil as a mensch, whereas just reading them, he just seems like, you know, uh, a complete uh, MIT, you know, um, techno to it. <laughs> yeah, there is there's that whole issue of his, his work being kind of impelled and motivated by the death of his father, and it really puts it all into that larger, uh, you know, historical context of the continuity of all of us attempting for the same emotional reasons, the same transcendence through new, through new means. Um, this isn't just a technological metaphor. I mean, when he gets down to the end of moving beyond the misplaced concreteness of downloading the soul into a computer, which is utter nonsense, um, uh, and he starts talking about, you know, becoming transcendent beings of space and time, it's like the twirling topological figures in Arthur C. Clarke's 2001. You know, remember in the movie when the astronaut is uh, out there with the first uh, stargate and these beings come on a horizon and they're rotating crystals of complexity. And in Arthur C. Clarke's book on the film, uh, the novel from which the film is based, uh, he's very clear that these are beings who have evolved beyond bodies and our structures of music and mathematics, which <clears throat> used to be called the celestial intelligences and neoplatonism or angels. So this is just, you know, uh, science fiction reclothing cosmological concepts that have been with us, you know, for a long time. Yeah. Persian uh, angelology. Yeah. So I'm, uh, you know, uh, take all this stuff with a grain of salt. A lot of excitement. One of the things that I like about your writing that was that I was especially, um, uh, I guess, moved by reading, I was introduced to you through coming into being, and it was, it was the your your talk of sympathetic resonance and entrainment between human beings in these larger musical and mathematical uh, angelic structures. Um, mm -hmm. That that really hit it for me because. Um, and that's that's kind of what I'm getting at with this whole like we missed the singularity thing that that for me it seems that we're already really um, embedded in these larger patterns um, that in some sense display their own uh, agency and intelligence um, and that what we're going through right now isn't so much or perhaps is not best described or characterized as us creating these structures as it is us becoming aware of them. So like... Yeah, yeah. yeah no, the short answer to all of that is yes. Um, that um, the singularity is uh, brought forth by your horizon of perception. So there is always, uh, you know, it's like when you look at a horizon and you walk toward it, the horizon moves because the horizon isn't a place, it's a relationship between your perceptual structural system and your location. And so uh, there's always a singularity, exactly as you say. Um, and there are these, you know, historical moments of shared singularities like, you know, harmonization of the primates or 
you know, agriculturalization or, you know, the shift from print to electronics, these kind of uh, shared media of communication that McLuhan and others looked at, but to, um, to reify it and give it a date the way Kurzweil did uh, in 2050, you know, uh, it'll all be over for biology is, I think, a mistake, very much like the mistake Edgar Casey made in trying to make predictions out of prophecy. Prophecy is a, a function of the imagination in, in exploring the implications of the present and rendering those implications into the metaphor of the future. So uh, when you give a date to it, as he did, then the prophets are generally wrong. I mean, you know, California is still there. It hasn't dropped into the sea. New York was supposed to be destroyed by earthquake in the 90s. Atlantis was supposed to rise in the Bahamas, uh, uh, and none of that has happened. You know, um, submarines claim there are sunken temples off Cuba, but you know they're sunken. They haven't uh, come up on the water the way Casey said. And if they are indeed temples and not just basaltic, you know, natural configurations. So what goes on with prophecy, and I'm including Kurzweil in this. Uh, Edgar Casey and Kurzweil are isomorphic. They're in totally different cognitive uh, domains and traditions. One is evangelical fundamentalism from Kentucky. The other is high-tech science fiction mysticism from MIT. But uh, prophecy is really perceiving the quantum potential states. And the close, you know, there are all these multiple futures that are possible, the quantum potential states. And when you move into the present, they collapse into a classical causal Newtonian physical system, a causal chain. But um, the, the, the ones are possible, you know, like I, in 1975, I had a kind of vision of New York underwater, where the water was up to the sixth floor. And then in uh, Albert Gore's uh, film on global warming, he started talking about what the flooding of all the coastlines in the world would mean for London and New York and all the rest of it. But uh, I wasn't seeing the actual future of New York. I was seeing the quantum potential states of global warming. And so prophets generally, because they're sensitive to an imaginative mode of hyperdimensional perception, uh, when they bring collapse down into three-dimensional space-time, they tend to uh, suffer from what Whitehead called misplaced concreteness, and they get it wrong, and they start making predictions, and the predictions are always wrong. So, you, so I try to avoid that mistake. You um, you brought this whole thing up in a, uh, I can't remember where exactly I found this article. It might have been one of your, your posts on Wild River Review. But you were talking about um, the recently late Lynn Margulis uh, the woman who kind of pioneered this notion of endosymbiosis, that right. that evolutionary transformations, uh, transitions in individuality proceed through including prior structures into these newer, more complex yeah, structures. Right. You know, yeah. And you mentioned, um, you said, uh, according to this uh, kind of age of spiritual machines way of thinking, that by 2030, if we we're lucky, we will be, we humans will become the house pets or potted plants of these machines, or if we're lucky, like the tiny mitochondria that moved around inside the, the eukaryotic cell and we're able to keep some of their ancient DNA. And you say, expect to see an art that crosses genes, DNA spirals, music and vibration into some new form of installation. And that, uh, Which I call the yeah, and you and uh, so you're looking at this as a, as a, a revolution or a, uh, a resurrection of human sacrifice because we're, we're now taking the, the human body and human culture as an art object and playing with it. Well, those are two different streams going on in the culture. The human sacrifice is the sensitivity of some people to the transformation. Um, uh, one could call it singularity or transformation. Transformation gives us more uh, flexible time. Uh, singularity tends to collapse it into an event, which I think is uh, a dimensional failure of topological imagination. So these people are, uh, feel like they're evolutionary 
waste. And so they pierce themselves, they, you know, you know, tattoo themselves to the extreme. Um, they, you know, they do drugs. Uh, uh, there's a kind of, uh, you know, masochistic element. And I think those are people for whom they don't feel a kind of joyous riding of the evolutionary wave. They feel like they're getting drowned by a tsunami. So their, their behavior, I think, is kind of pathological. And I would not, um, you know, be part of that uh, group. Uh, I think they, they see themselves as evolutionary victims. And um, I, uh, I just don't go there because uh, I don't think it's just a healthy place to hang out. And then the, all the other groups are, are quite different in range from Kurzweil to New Age to fundamentalist ra rapture, the literal Christian one, to the messianism of Shia, uh, you know, the hidden imam coming forth, the 12th imam. Uh, that's equally kind of messianic looking to a, a meta event that's going to intersect with historical time. So how do you, um, what do you see as a, as a healthy response to this, uh, accelerating sense of future shock and this recognition that, you know, the, the world that we were br brought up to, to care about is seemingly, or at least is being sold to us as a uh, an evolutionary backwater well i, I think i've uh, you know in terms of performance art uh embodied it in the lindisfarne intellectual chamber music of the last 30 years because it includes living machines in which various uh, uh ontological levels from the bacteria to the snails to the plant level of water hyacinths are used to create a kind of meta-industrial village that uh, turns pollution into uh, information and recycles it as, a, as an energy source. And so the relationship between John Todd's invention of living machines to Sim van der Rijn's, uh green architecture and David Orr's work in green architecture at Oberlin College and their environmental studies program to the poetics of it, uh, conservatively with Wendell Berry in an agricultural context, to even more conservatively in a free agriculture with Gary Snyder. Um, this has all been what Linda and Lynn Margulis and Jim Lovelock. This is what Linda's Farm's all about. So we're trying to create symbiotic human settlements in which the mineral realm, the elemental and esoteric terms, and the uh, bacterial realm and the vegetative realm are all integrated into the design of new human communities that are not as destructive as the industrial nation state. And this obviously has been the dissenting, you know, backbenchers politics because what we see now are just, you know, a very narrow range of, you know, democratic industrialism versus, you know, republican industrialism. And that's pretty much, you know, as with the failure of Durban or Kyoto, is, you know, going nowhere in terms of ecology. So uh, I'm very much in that camp. And But I would extend it even beyond to say beyond the symbiotic meta-industrial village, which is a term I used in an essay in Darkness and Scattered Light, uh, way back in the 70s, 70, it was a lecture at Lindisfarne in Manhattan, maybe in 1977, and it became a cover issue for Mother Earth News or some eco magazine back 30 years ago. I would extend it to the IntelliKey, uh, mystically to say that we need to kind of culturally retrieve, in the fluence phrase, um, the sensitivity to the elemental realm that stones, I'm fondling a touchstone here that's a beautiful uh, piece of stone that comes from St. Martin's Cave in Iona in the Hebrides, that stones are alive and hear the music of the spheres and come from exploded supernovas and they're uh, 
they're seen in the Tolkien form as dwarves, people who work in the mines and in the underworld. And then there are the elementals of air, the Tolkien elves, and then there are, you know, the celestial intelligence of music and mathematics, the angelic realm. And that the shaman, the contemporary shaman, uh, is sensitive and develops through some kind of yoga practice, whether it's Vedic yoga in your tanka behind you, or Buddhism, or there, there are many different paths and not just one, sensitizes his subtle body so that each subtle body has a matching grant where a being of that realm becomes a partner. This is like a mystical version of acquired genomes, if you've seen Lynn's films or read her book. So when you're, for example, a martial artist, say like a samurai, uh, classically, you ensoul your sword. Your sword is not just any old hunk of metal, and it's not a tool in the industrial mentality. Uh, this is why in medieval literature the swords are named. The sword of Charlemagne is called Montjoie. The sword of Roland uh, is called Durandal. The sword of Arthur is called Excalibur. These are these are instruments, like a musical instrument, since you're a musician, um, that the sensitive has ensouled and created a relationship or conversation between the entity that's inside the sword uh, or the staff. Uh, it, it, it can vary culture to culture. But the interesting thing about this sort of retrieving this in a technological society is I had a conversation with our Lindisfarne fellow, Rustin Schweikert, who's an astronaut and uh, was the first to float without a uh, umbilical cord in space and look down on the the earth. Um, he said that really top flight great jet pilots can sold their jets and they can do things with the jet, top gun, that no other ordinary pilot can do. They're just extraordinary in the way that a samurai would be an extraordinary swordsman. So even at the level of complexity of an F-16, uh, a, a, a martial artist who's sensitive to ensouling and bringing the whole uh, complexity of electronics and metal and and everything that goes to make and make it one with his imagination and his consciousness, um, they uh, they have this ability. So, what were you talking about? The guy from London with uh, what? What was his phrase for this kind of uh, union of technology and consciousness? Mm. So the hybrid, the hybrid reality. Yeah. Yeah. The hybrid reality. So this is a hybrid reality between the elemental realm and uh, and so shamans will, you know, affect the weather, uh, and they do it by by going in dialogue with the, with the jinn, with the which is the Islamic term for these critters. Uh, and others will then on the next subtle realm of say the. Um, the astral realm, uh, there will be a kind of contrasexual figure that uh, Jung used to talk about with the anima animus, and there'll be a kind of like Tara, and then the mental realm, there'll be a kind of angelic being of music and mathematics of the kind that Arthur C. Clarke presented in the movie and in the novel. And I talked to him about that too when what did film, uh, I met him in New York. So, what did he have to say? Uh, he said that the uh, the Stargate. Uh, he was very atheistic and, and uh, anti-mystical, but always came up with mystical mythologies. You know, so he's he was kind of like Kurzweil in that way, because he had been raised in a traditional English society where religion was really you know a stupid Anglican church and stuff, and he said it was a black hole and that actually another universe was leaking in to this one, uh, and these beings were coming through the, the black hole, wormhole, uh, to the astronaut when he came to the Stargate outside Jupiter. But I you know, described in the book, this is at the edge of history, how uh, 
the spaceship looks like the spinal column of the, you know, of the human being, and the stargate is like the stargate of the third eye in yoga. So uh, Arthur C. Clarke is presenting in scientific terms a lot of stuff that's basically in the, the mythological system of uh, Vedic yoga. So when you have a matching grant at all these various energy levels, the consciousness field of a human being is no longer just human. It's, uh, it's like the Fantastic Four in comic books, uh, or it's like the four in, um, and I talked about this in an essay in uh, uh, Seven Pillars Review online, um, the four you know, beings in The Wizard of Oz are another dramatization of this uh, creatures of the various uh, bodies. So uh, on their way to the Emerald City, which is a technical term from Sufism, so the Wizard of Oz is actually a mystical Sufi parable rendered into, you know, Kansas American, you know, heartland cornball uh, uh, imagery. But when you have this kind of uh, entelechy of an awakened human being who's working in concert with an elemental, you know, with a, you know, with an angel, with a various bodhisattvic beings from whatever religious tradition, uh, then you have a very different kind of critter than someone who is covetous, grasping, polluting, just destructive in the way that the uh, heroes of our society, from Goldman Sachs to the Koch brothers, are all highly uh, highly aggressive alpha male who uh, create enormous, uh, you know, suffering in both human beings and animals. I mean, just look what they're doing to Kentucky, where they level the mountains and pour all the poisons into the valley where the people live, and they say, we don't care, screw you. And they do, Longmount does the same thing in mining in Indonesia. They use arsenic in the water, and all the children in Indonesia are getting uh, cancer. And they say, fuck it, we just, you know, we're, we're only concerned with our stockholders and our uh, stock price and the corporate quarterly report. So that, these are the heroes, Goldman Sachs heroes of Robert Barron hypercapitalism, which is coming to its climactic, uh, just that, to its climax. Uh, I hope it's climactic again. But um, this new form, this new evolutionary, mutation is small and on on the, on the edge of the horizon and so it's sort of like the mammals in the underbrush during the age of dinosaurs and when the uh, when the meteor hits the planet then you know the dinosaurs disappear and the little mammals come out and have their time in history it's a uh, it's an interesting correlation to draw because uh I got my training in paleontology and my professor, uh, Robert Bacher, who himself... Where, where, where was this? This was at the University of Kansas, but I did field research with the Wyoming Dinosaur Society in, out, in Como Bluff, in uh, Lawrence, Kansas. Lawrence. Um, but, um, but working under a, a different institution, uh, doing my field research out with a guy who was actually um, a Talmudic scholar and taught taught the, uh, the Old Testament in Hebrew, as well as anatomy at Johns Hopkins, and did all this stuff about warm-blooded dinosaurs. But the point was that he said that if, we're not, if we understand paleoecology as a complex system, uh, it doesn't make sense. The extinction pattern of the, the late Cretaceous doesn't make sense as the symptom or consequence or product of this one meteoric impact. And in fact, yeah. a couple of years later, they found that there were actually dinosaurs living in the impact crater thousands of years after the impact. So it, he, was, he was saying there's a much more intricate relationship between changing sea levels, land bridges, disease flow, that- the Same thing with the extinction of the Pleistocene megafauna. It's, you know, uh, it's a whole complex relationship between the use of fire by Indians and weather change and, and hunting. And it's not just that all the Indians just killed them all off. Uh, there were diseases and, and sometimes, you know, when the weather changes, the trees get viruses and begin to get sick, like the pinions in, in New Mexico or Southern Colorado. 
uh, and then they they break down and get more infested with you know gypsy moss or beetles or things of this sort. So it it sets a cascade. You know, complex dynamical systems is the right way to look at it. And once the cascade is triggered, it might be triggered by an you know a bolide. But the repercussions are certainly not just singly causal the bolide that hits uh, that hits the earth. Yeah. So, like in light of this, looking at it in terms of mass extinctions, uh, I find it kind of interesting that there's a um, uh, kind of an ecocide cult developing now. Um, Brian Swim articulated it as saying that we may be able to view our participation in this sixth mass extinction as a kind of planetary crucifixion, and that we may it may catalyze a uh, a new planet that that may be the the sacrifice for this new planetary spirituality and so you see all these people going around saying we're killing the planet um which you know i don't really accept but it seems like a natural consequence of you know i i made mommy sad you know it's we're, we're beginning to recognize our yeah 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 and brian you know uh, is hand in glove with creationism uh Christian creation and spirituality, the, from Brian Slim to uh, Tom um, Thomas Berry, uh, and uh, the trouble with the eco green movement is it tends to think of nature as just the tree canopy of the planet and lovely, you know, koala bears and and mammals, and that's just this thin, you know, veneer. And the real process, as Lynn would be the first to say is much deeper and tougher and you know it i you talked about kansas i was arguing with uh, uh west that you know if one looks at supernova and the death of stars and heavy metals that sink to the core of the planet and create a magnetic field which creates protection for you know lipid proteins and and me cells and and cellular uh walls and and the evolution of the cell, then the whole thing, there isn't a great division between the mineral realm and the biological realm. And so ecology has to be thought of in a much more dynamic, vigorous sense. And if one looked at the bacterial level as something that was really ugly, let's say an oil slick in a New Jersey refinery or something, you know, it might might be really beautiful at the bacterial level. Uh, it's not just, you know, uh, Robin Hood uh, ecology of the, the merry men in the forest. So uh, ecology has to be more tough-minded and look at Lynn's work. And, and she, at the last Linda's Fine Fellows meeting before she died, this was in uh, October, and she died in November, um, I, I said it on um, Podium that hey guys, there's no way that we can not be embedded in nature. And she smiled broadly because she knows that the bacteria are in our guts, and we're in this planetary biofilm of bacteria. And there's uh, our whole way of thinking of individuals is just wrong. You know, we can't take a human being out of a biosphere, put him in a tin can, and rocket him off to Mars. That's just not going to work because we have all this bacteria inside us, all of this sustains us. We have to move biosphere to biosphere. So what we have to ship to Mars is, you know, would take centuries and have to start at the bacterial level of exporting cyanobacteria that will synthesize and start working on the atmosphere. And then after we transported, you know, a biosphere one, we move to biosphere two, biosphere three, and eventually, you know, in a centuries-long transformation, we might be able to have a faster, you know, spaceship that could take a, a human being to Mars, but we can't do it in the way that NASA thinks of it. It's just nonsense. And Lynn, you know, knew that very well. <clears throat> so once one understands there's this complexity and interpenetrating uh, dimensions of elemental and... Um, you know, angelic and human and beyond, uh, then it gets really interesting. But it's, uh, it's not what is the imagination of uh, your average Joe Sixpack today. So there's this, um, there's this tie that we can make between 
what we were talking about just a moment ago about insold technology. And what I think for me is like the, the best available uh, example of this kind of uh, biospheric understanding informing our technology, which is the spherical bubble ship from Darren Aronofsky's film, The Fountain. Have you seen that? I haven't, but I, uh, you know, in the remake of The Day the Earth Stood Still, mm -hmm. they had a similar thing. Yeah, the, it contained the... Um, no controls on this ship. And uh, in, at least in The Fountain, um, the main character, it's, it's told in like pre-modern, modern, and, and post-modern uh, parallel timelines, the same characters living through the same kind of archetypal relationships. And uh, in this one, he's, you know, it's, it's the protagonist and a tree, and they're, they're on this kind of spiritual pilgrimage. Um, but there's a line between that and um, what you know, you're you're talking about the IntelliKey and this new, um, I guess, integrated elemental selfhood, and then also, uh, regardless of how we're to interpret this stuff, the it's interesting to me that out of the kind of the 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 brush fire of conspiracy theory, we get these stories of recovered UFOs, recovered flying saucers and how none of them have had any discernible controls. And that supposedly, according to the testimony of the people who worked uh, black ops trying to understand these ships, uh, the, the narrative is that they ended up retro-engineering craft that were piloted uh, tele telepathically. Uh -huh. um, I'm not, uh, that's, I, perhaps that's kind of a, a, a tangent. But it's um... conspiracy theories are a form of the imagination because when you live in a society where the news is owned by corporations and controlled, uh, you know, capital industries owns what uh, NBC or you know and Fox News and all of that, uh, then the average individual knows that uh, something is going on, and so he connects the dots try to create a gestalt in which this makes sense. And it can become paranoid because he can say, hey, did you see the numbers on that license plate? Right as this, you know, uh, pigeon moved over there, these are related, you know, the, right, the license plates are talking to me. Uh, and that's clearly, you know, uh, paranoid cosmic synthesis, which is a form of excessive madness. But there's a realm of the poetic imagination that Shakespeare said the lunatic and the lover are, are of imagination, all compact, that is much closer to the culture and much uh, more sensible and is a study of the implications of the present. And these would be not the conspiracy nut bars and wing nuts, but the science fiction writers. And so sometimes the conspiracy people will make a connection, but they'll get the right structure, but give it the wrong content. And they'll say, oh, it's all coming from the Rockefellers, when it may not be coming from the Rockefellers. It might be, you know, an invisible industrial group of a hundred uh, people who meet, like uh, the Koch brothers gang that get together in, uh, you know, Palm Springs once a year to work out their strategies. So, I, do you um, do you look at stuff like the MIT emotional robotics work and uh, this attempt to put like ch smart chips in everything that we have? Do you see that as a a a valid sort of relationship to this inherited understanding of of uh, our supposedly inanimate? Re environment as in sold, or do you see it as, as no, kind of a, a counterfeit? I think it's the mirror opposite. It's the lack of sensitivity and the inability to uh, break out of materialism. So there, there are two mistakes going on. The first is, you know, creating all these little faces on the guy with the eyebrows that raised and the big eyes and the smiley. Uh, 
But, I mean, why make a robot into the shape of, of a human being? Just, you know, design it for whatever function you want it to do, whether it's defusing bombs or whatever. And so that that's just uh, their competition with biology, that engineers think that, you know, biology is wet and feminine and primitive, but what's really advanced is technology that's hard and, and made out of metal. And so it's this kind of, you know, phallic imagination versus a kind of vaginal softness and uh, indistinct darkness, wet biology versus MIT engineering. So it's, uh, it's again, a form of, um, of misplaced concreteness. The other side of their... Uh, uh, is a perception that, uh, say, war, for example, what we've learned as war as an institution in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, especially Iraq, is that all forms of war are now suicide bombing because the uranium depleted artillery shells we use have caused, like Agent Orange in Vietnam, hideous. Uh, genetic uh, monsters of, with children in Iraq. You know, you can go on the web and see pictures of these horrific beings, uh, infants and, and children, in much that you can see the same with Chernobyl, uh, if you go on the web, or there are these fetuses in bottles in the museum in Hanoi showing the impact of Agent Orange on, um, on the population. But our soldiers are also getting sick. Uh, it's not just post-traumatic syndrome. Uh, they're also uh, getting sick from the toxicity of our own weapons. Sometimes, you know, working in an intense electromagnetic field like a nuclear sub increases the cancer rates for the sailors. So what we're seeing is war shifting to drones and robotics. And nanotechnology will soon make the drones even smaller for, you know, I think there's some place on the web where they show a drone the size of a dragonfly flying over a crowd of protesters and dropping on the head of one protester a, a, a kind of a phosphorescent fluid that under a blue light the cops can see, aha, you were there and are rescued. And now under the National Defense Authorization Act, which Congress just passed, and Obama says he won't veto. Uh, you can just call any protester a, uh, a terrorist sympathizer and disappear him. So America's really moving down a very uh, ugly creode. And um, it's going the way of the colonels in Argentina. So we will have the Esparacidos uh, in the not too distant future. So that, uh, that means that warfare. And all that has to be entirely redesigned, which, of course, that's MIT's job. Uh, Two-thirds of its budget comes from the Defense Department. So we will have these robotics uh, exporting violence to recalcitrant, uh, primitive, you know, cultures that we don't like, whether it's Afghanistan or, you know, wherever. And we won't have to ship boots on the ground which tend to be unpopular with, you know, you know, the people and cause demonstrations like Vietnam. So if it's all done in the secret ops, black ops kind of way, then um, there's a whole new toolkit that's being, you know, designed. And it basically is phasing out war as we know it. Humane war that preserves the charism charismatic species. It still is humane war, but it's just not what we're talking about. You're talking about symbiosis. The, uh, the union is not a shamanic union with a gin or an elemental. It's with an instrument. So there's this redneck in a garage in, La in Vegas who is playing joystick you know, computer games with a drone over Yemen and deciding to kill people. Bam! Snap! I got the back. So it's uh, it's an ugly form of symbiosis. There was a there's a <laughs> there's a film that addresses this directly. It was a uh, it's a Mexican science fiction movie called Sleep Dealer, and uh, the premise of the film is that 
uh, Mexico is basically uh, importing uh, telecommute virtual laborers working through robots into the United States. The border is, not, you can't even cross the border anymore. And so what you have is on one end, you have all of the imported laborers at home in Mexico working from a, uh, what is essentially like a factory farm for dreamers. And then on the other, the other end of the, the spectrum, you have these uh, American fighter pilots who are on um, virtual reality consoles that are taking out, uh, they're doing border patrol work and they're taking out people who are actually attempting to physically immigrate across the, the borderline. But then what, ha what happens is that uh, there's this, through the virtual reality interface, the pilot sees some expression of emotion in the people that he's been, he's been taking out as, as potential terrorists, cyber terrorists across in, in Mexico. And he, uh, he goes undercover across the border and meets these people. And there's this moment where he finds this, this guy who's just a totally harmless guy who's been uh, falsely tagged as a potential terrorist that he's supposed to be assassinated by this, this guy. And he finds him in a cafe and, and introduces himself to him. And so there's like, I, there's this whole, I, I'm, I'm as concerned as you are about, uh, you know, drone warfare as being this sort of, uh, when I say like a humane war, it's this sanitized war where you can take out the whole rainforest, but not the animal that was in the World Wildlife Foundation commercial. You know, as long as you maintain the spotted owl, then everything else can go. Um, but then there's this other part of it, which is that it's the very same technology is enabling us to look one another in the eye across the planet and re recognize directly the consequences of these uh, externalized factors. You know, it's like the Internet was developed by the Department of Defense to maintain communications in, in, in case of nuclear war, but then it's, it, you know, that same technology ultimately enabled Arab Spring and the Occupy movement. And it seems like there, there may be this kind of uh, kundalini because movement. Face, because, you know, wearing a virtual reality helmet could cause, you know, epileptic fits or, or in some way interfere with neuronal synchrony, uh, the way in which uh, a cell, a neuron here and a neuron here will participate in the same thought and vibrated 40 hertz. So we know the brain is uh, an electromagnetic system. So wearing a, a helmet and being in a deeply saturated electromagnetic field uh, could really fry. Uh, and the pilot might only have an effective career of a year before he's waste. So we just don't know. And, and if they know this, you're not going to tell us. But do you think it's possible that there may be uh, kind of a, a developmental arc for our technologies where they start out as, uh, you know, motivated by a survival benefit? It starts, you know, everything might start out military and then be demilitarized. Is, I mean, that's, that's yeah. sort of what I see. Certainly, it goes, it goes both ways. I mean, you know, um, generally when a guy comes in with a new technology, he'll optimistically say all kinds of good things. Oh, we'll be able to have lectures on television and people will become much smarter and have a wonderful impact on education. And what actually happened was it was a form, excuse me, of dumbing us down. And television didn't go that way. And radio, you know, broadcast music, but it was also the instrument of political consolidation for, uh, you know, for Hitler and FDR and Churchill. I mean, three different versions of the the great leader in wartime. Uh, so radio had both a light and shadow formation. Television now shadow is larger than its light. I don't even have a, a television because it's just like a cognitive sewer who wants to pay a hundred bucks a month to a cable company that insists on bundling the channels and doesn't give you a choice. <laughs> so I just unplugged from television and I'm. Uh, my room is, you know, my apartment's quiet, and I, you know, and I read. And when I want to watch a television series, I get it from Netflix and watch it on the weekend without commercials. The whole thing, you know, whether it's, you know, Dawn uh, Lodge you know, from the BBC or Mad Men from, uh, you know, American TV. So there's always light and shadow when a new technology comes in. 
but for the most part, as I've said, you know, in um, in, in more than one of my books, um, uh, evil is the enunciation of the next level of order. And so, after the Vikings project all over the Atlantic, uh, moving out of classic neo classical civilization around the Mediterranean cultural ecology, then uh, it moves into parliamentary democracies and the emergence of, you know, Western civilization and, and you know, the Americas, the American Revolution. So there is there's always this uh, shift, but when it first comes in, we generally see it uh, in its, as you say, war defense form. And your metaphor of the, uh, of, uh, what's it called, DARPA, um, is good. That uh, DARPA then changed to the source and was used for scholars to get together in universities uh, around the country. I once taught a course in, through the source in the early 90s, I guess, before there was the World Wide Web. And then uh, in comes the World Wide Web, but it's very fragile. It's a pyramid on its point because if there's an electromagnetic pulse from the solar flare, then boom, there go the gas pumps, there go the ATMs, and there go Skype, you know. And we're, people are so addicted to the Internet that, man, it's going to be like heroin withdrawal when, when that happens. Well, you, um, you mentioned in a... I'm not sure if it was uh, the Borg or Borges, or it was yeah. another one of the articles I read recently where you were talking about um, there being, in kind of an Alfred North Whitehead sense, a kernel of choice in subatomic particles, and therefore the evolutionary process, uh, random DNA being hit by some, you know, uh, decaying cosmic particle, you know, from another world, that in some sense that. Uh, brings choice back to the level of random mutation, and uh, it brings mind back into the issue. And I've been I've been sitting here thinking about this issue. You you know you bring up the solar flare, and also there's a section in in coming into being where uh, I had been sitting researching the the effects of solar cycles on you know the the correlations that have been drawn uh, about uh, solar maxima, sunspot activity, wars, and creative revolutions, saying that you know, as we approach a solar maximum that we see these creative renaissances and these escalations in conflict and that, you know, it may have, it, it brings the elemental part of back into the conversation because we're talking about, you know, gravitational influences and, and uh, solar and lunar tides, the piezoelectric effect on the ground and all of us being within that, that system. Um, but, uh, there's this part in, in coming into being where you talk about the, p the potential, and I, you may have just been kind of waxing here, but the, the potential that a solar flare would trigger this uh, collective near-death experience. And, um, oh, yeah, when I, when I, well, that's not only just the solar flare. I mean, there's, there's a time when the reversal of the Earth's magnetic field, where the field drops and stops before it repolarizes in a different location and then, you know, maybe can even change its spin. And so there would be a period when our guard was down and we would not have a protective uh, electromagnetic field on the planet protecting us from cosmic radiation and what effects that would have. Uh, but they're all happening at once. You know, you've got the rising sea level, which if it goes up, to say, you know, just to take Greenland, they said that I don't know. And there was on the web this week a uh, hundred billion tons of ice water have uh, hit the ocean in just the last year from global warming, and and it's flowing under the ice sheet. So the ice sheet could just reach a, uh, a you know a butterfly effect and just suddenly drop, and the water would go up you know 300 feet. Well, that'll take out the whole you know east coast from Miami to Maine. Uh, where I'm sitting is about 190 feet above sea level. So, you know, if it goes 300, I'm underwater. Uh, the U.S. Geological Survey already shows some global warming that the old port down downhill will be no longer there. 
So when that happens in conjunction with all these other events like salinization of the Ogallala Aquifer, where, where you come from, uh, earthquakes, tsunamis, uh, you know, the, the tectonic earthquake in Fukushima was uh, ruptured the plate. And so we're likely to have an earthquake in Tokyo that, uh, and Istanbul, where these plates meet, that would just take out, you know, a million people. I mean, you know, because once you've got 20 people crowded into, you know, a city over a major, you know, catastrophe zone, Jesus, I mean, that's just, you know, uh, on a scale that we haven't experienced in recorded history, certainly. It's kind of like an Atlantis myth. So those are all going on at the same time. So the cumulative effect of that cascade is unpredictable. Um, and, and therefore only the imagination can explore the implications and the imagination expresses itself in art, science fiction, conspiracy theories, pornography, whatever. And so a good cultural historian has to, you know, use a radar sweep of taking it all in, not just, you know, reading foreign affairs and you know, textbooks on economics. All right. You know, this is uh, related to um, this particular stream of research that uh, this guy Darren Lipnicki did in Perth, Australia, where over seven years he recorded about 2,000 dreams and then correlated, correlated his dreams with the local geomagnetic activity. And what he found was that when the magnetic fields around Perth were at their weakest, he was having his most unusual, fantastical dreams. Um, that, and his his kind of his conclusion from that was that uh, there was something about the intensity of the local magnetic fields that may have been entraining him uh, into a, a more rigid uh, consensus. That there may have been some sort of biochemical, or I mean, rather, you know, neurochemical effect that the uh, the local magnetic activity was happening, and that. You know, maybe if we were to extrapolate over the whole surface of the planet, we would notice that there are these uh, these areas of intense creativity on the borders of plates like Tokyo and San Francisco, where uh, there the insanity as well as the the kind of creative libido of these places may be in part due to the fact that they're um, may, perhaps like less synchronized. Uh, and more exposed, more open. You know, so it's like this idea that, that it, we're... And it affects the weather as well. So, so you get weather cycles that have a profound effect on, you know, agricultural revolution or uh, renaissance or whatever when there are warm cycles and when there are ice ages and things. So all of these things, El Nino's, yeah, they're, they're beginning to find correlations that they didn't um, see before. You know, just as a cop will always say, well, I know it's crazy, but, you know, always with the full moon, we're more active than, you know, uh, than at other times. And for some reason, there are a lot of lunatics out there. So, um, I guess w the next question I would have for you is like, so, you know, you say, well, I've got I've got the television off, but you can't stop the fact that you're being saturated in Wi-Fi and, and cell phone signals and pretty much. Oh, yeah, yeah no, I'm, I'm, I, in my book, The American Replacement of Nature, I use the metaphor where we're all uh, chunks of meat in an electromagnetic stew. So we're definitely floating in this sea of pollution that has, you know, unknown effects. The um, Lynn always said that mutation creates more damage than it creates evolution and that that's why she always argued that the big uh, challenging the neo-Darwinian synthesis that the the big changes are, are from acquired genomes and so uh, the symbiotic fusions uh, seem to be more interesting than hoping that a random cosmic ray you know uh, is going to knock out a gene and give us Superman or something or other. I, I'm not too hopeful in that in that uh, narrative. So, what do you what do you see as the the next import? I guess then uh, the next or rather talking about this hybrid reality, where in some parts of the culture, you know, in, in Arthur C. Clarke's book, The City and the Stars, he has two 
archetypally different cultures. One was under a bucket full of geodesic dome and it's high tech to the max. It's like a solar ecology with maglev trains and all that. And the other is a neo stone age culture that uh, has developed psychic powers and they live more like whales and dolphins than they live like uh, high tech human beings. And so from, from the point of view of this other culture, what's really advanced is the uh, etherealization of technology. It's uh, technology is a crutch and not a, not a good thing. And that uh, the whales may be creating these symphonies in conversation with Andromeda and hearing Andromeda's response. And their culture is so light years ahead of us um, that we can't even see it, you know, like ants crawling across the Sistine Chapel or flies crawling across the Sistine Chapel. We don't get the big picture. So humans certainly are destructive uh, and the most destructive species, but bacteria can be very destructive. I mean, they don't, want, you know, when they get going on a bloom, they just keep going until they, you know, boom bust, you know. So um, we're becoming more like bacteria and less sort of like animals. That's uh, something I've been thinking a lot about recently is the connection between uh, the situation that we're in right now and the first mass extinction, what they call the, the, the global oxygenation event. When we had the, yeah. the, these blooms of photosynthetic cyanobacteria that oxygenated Earth's atmosphere for the first time. And at the time, there was no oxygen. form of excretion. So, you know, this is where one man's shit becomes another man's nutrient. Right, but first we, you know, the first thing that happened before we learned to, before anything evolved in oxygen-based metabolism is we almost set the sky on fire. And there seems to be this, you know, at the time, we were living in a, a you know, something very close. We had just come out of this, I guess what they call a, the last universal common ancestor, which was basically this global uh, genetic internet where, you know, selfhood was more or less freely exchanged. It hadn't really fully speciated yet. And it seems like... Uh, You're talking at the bacterial level. Yeah, yeah, that, that you know, this, the, the planetary bioplasm that you mentioned, this, this thin film of cells over the whole surface of the planet was at the time not really um, well differentiated at all and can best perhaps, you know, the, the kind of consensus on it right now is that it's best thought of as a single organism. So like... That's what Soren Sanders says. And it can exchange much more easily genomes, you know, uh, through conjugation rather than sexual reproduction. It was, the it was the eukaryotic cell that accelerated time by getting us um, package genomes that threw half their genetic inheritance away to be open to, you know, impregnation, you know, meiotically by other critters. So uh, the bacterial form is definitely uh, epochal in slower and massive lengths of time, and the eukaryotic revolution is an acceleration of the rate of change. So do you, do you see? There's be, there as being a kind of a implosion of counter counterflows between this ongoing eukaryotization that we are experiencing with our technologies, as well as this bacterial level at which we're all exchanging our, our genes, or our ideas, our memes. Between two civilizational systems, you get a dark age as the uh, phase change takes place. So in between the next thing, uh, there may be this turn on the spiral where we become more prokaryotic and less eukaryotic, and there is a, a big dieback of the human species and a proliferation of more, you know, primitive life forms and also probably in some elements a high-tech survival society or whatever that's working on this hybrid reality. So we may have a, you know, a transitional stage that's uh, bumpy, you know, and it's, uh, it's not a, uh, a, a comfortable, easy transition from one to another. There's a loss of culture. You know, if you look at the cave paintings of Lascaux and you look at the Mesolithic cave paintings, they're really crappy compared to the high art of Chauvet Cave and, and Lascaux. So there's a loss of culture between the Ice Age 
and the emergence of agriculture. And it takes agriculture quite a while before it culturally reaches a level that's superior to Ice Age, uh, you know, hunting and gathering. So we may be in for something uh, like that. Kind of a simultaneous acceleration and deceleration of time. And this. Well, think of it in terms of ferromagnetic domains that when, when a metal goes from conducting to superconducting, there are two electrons called Cooper twins that travel through the lattice and infect the entire lattice that was flipped from resistant to superconducting. And two, two electrons can make, you know, a big difference. So let's imagine, you know, that you and I are like two electrons of consciousness and we're already living in a different uh, civilization than our cohorts all around us. And for some reason, rather than, you know, having uh, the continuation of industrial society, it reaches its limit and collapses at the same time this other new thing is, is emerging. So uh, you could have both going on at the same time. It's kind of a, or go ahead, sorry. Yeah, but, but it still would be for millions of people. You know, Wes Jackson from the Land Institute in Kansas thinks that we're facing a dieback of about two billion people. You know, and, and this is what E.O. Wilson calls the evolutionary bottleneck. Because around 70,000 BC, you probably know this already, there were only about 7,000 hominids. So there was, you know, was a very, very, and we almost, you know, reached, uh, you know, extinction. And somehow or other, uh, the extinction that was occurring, uh, some think that the Yellowstone volcano blew up um, 70,000 years ago, and then it goes in a pulse of 70,000. So. Discovery Channel, which loves apocalypses, had this program about what happens if Yellowstone blows as a you know, super hot spot, and it would completely destroy American civilization. So you could have that kind of event going on. And we know from this, both Celtic and the Popol Vuh, that there was a period of darkness. So there are these volcanic events that really mess up the weather and, you know, the the tree rings in the west of Ireland show that there were 18 years without a summer in Western Europe, so Iceland probably blew up. And um, people were on the move, and they, there was no food, and they reformed in different groups, like the Sea Peoples, which was not a single ethnic group. It was a, a mixture of kind of pirates uh, who invaded, uh, you know, the Holy Land. And, um, but, and some people, moved into India, and it, it's called in German the Provoca Vandero, the wandering of the folk. And uh, so we could face something like that. And the Popol Vuh also says that in the, there was a period of darkness before Quetzalcoatl, you know, came and helped, you know, get society going again. It's uh, interesting that 70,000 years is... It's kind of hard to, to date these things exactly, but I remember reading that they took ice cores from Antarctica and found a 13,000 year periodicity of uh, higher concentrations of the radioactive isotope of beryllium. And it was contributing to this idea that there are these uh, periodic destabilizations, perhaps not a complete pole reversal, but a, a weakening of the ionosphere uh, that had to do with the precession of the equinoxes. and like. The, uh, the phase, the, or rather our, our angle of orientation relative to the galactic center. And so this, yeah. this idea that you know, we, when you lose the ionosphere, you lose the, uh, the magnetic dynamo that is, that is uh, regulating like volcanic and seismic activity as well. Um, but, this is, but it's all, I, I, for me, like part of this, like part of my motivation for talking about these things with people is that it seems to me that the human species uh, right now is is like 12 years old, pregnant, barefoot, with no adults around to tell her what's going on. And like what we see are all of these different crises, but like you said, it's important to understand them all as a single crisis. There's like a, there's this metaphor that's getting really popular. I think it was popularized by Deepak Chopra actually, but I don't think he's the one that, that was 
you know, that can be uh, claimed as originator of uh, the, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, not embryology, but the developmental sequence of a butterfly where it doesn't just grow wings and leave the chrysalis, but is actually digested by the later form. That it's, There's a small group of cells inside the butterfly that, that eventually radiate to create, or inside the caterpillar that eventually radiate to create the entire butterfly, but first they liquefy the caterpillar. And so the caterpillar actually mounts an immune response against the emergent butterfly, uh, sort of like, um, yeah. you know, mobilizing riot squads against the Occupy movement or yeah. something. It's a, uh, yeah. so like, I don't see, um, a lot of what scares me right now um, doesn't really, I don't feel like it really should be scary. You know, a lot of the, the world that we see falling apart, it seems, um, I don't, you know, I don't necessarily want to make this a, you know, a, a ritual blood sacrifice of the human species, but on some level it does seem um, natural and to, to a certain extent, not something that we can even really uh, alleviate without interfering with the process, or rather, to believe that we can geoengineer the you know a transitional a transitional moment in the individuality of our planet uh, seems very old school. Yeah, well, everyone has a different you know uh, response. So some people are afraid and become fundamentalists and just you know rigidify and hang on and try to take some past system and overextend it to uh, handle something it can't handle. So whether it's Marxist fundamentalism uh, and industrial society, or it's evangelical or Islamic or West settler uh, fundamentalism of, of the Jews in Israel, uh, you get this um, hysterical response that's basically generated by, you know, fear in the end of the world as they know it. And then you get this messianic utopian imagination, sort of, you know, the the rapture side and the Kurzweil types and the technological utopians of the, you know, Herman Kahn's and, you know, Bucky Fuller types who will see humanity moving into this global brain and becoming a, you know, a new species and colonizing the stars and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so there, there are different performances of the... Uh, of the imagination, and I don't, you know, fit into either one of those uh, extremes. So I'm more in the trying to as a look at the big picture and see perhaps uh, there is this uh, transition we're moving into that's going to be a bumpy, turbulent zone. But the interesting thing about whether it's at the subatomic level or it's at the historical level is every event is a bifurcation. There's always a choice between going this way or going that way. Uh, and once it activates that creode, then another you know, bifurcation comes and it creates this dendritic tree. Uh, and so the accumulation is uh, there's a lot of choice and there's a lot of un unpredictability. Uh, any complex dynamical system is not predictable. Uh, one has no way of knowing how all these things going on at the same time, what, you know, real impact they're going to have. But I generally tend to think that thinking that it's going to be a smooth transition of progress is an industrial imagination, and I just don't think it's going to be like that at all. It's going to be much more bumpy, but maybe I'm too apocalyptic, uh, and... Uh, the uh, utopians are, uh, are right that there will be this second coming of Jesus and the unpredictable and everything will come up roses. I don't know. So on the one hand, we have the fact that it's uh, irreducibly complex and there's no way to fully grok the consequences of our actions. But on the other hand, we have this notion of uh, this new extension of self into the environment, a rec you know, a, uh, a reconciliation with the embodied unconscious and this understanding that we're like a participant layer in this this planetary ecology and then there's like through that those uh rocks we're sailing this ship of the uh 
the narrowing latency between our ability to imagine something and our ability to execute it through technological means. It's something that uh, the uh, uh, media personality Jason Silva calls the the inc the instantiation of desire and creativity. And he, you know, he's taken as well as a lot of the, the not to like harp on the singularity university people, but um, they're taking this, you know, writing poetry in the language of DNA. Like uh, you mentioned somewhere, the idea that we would be able to use the computer the way Bach used an organ to commune with the divine. Um, but it seems to me like this, this gap, um, that this narrowing gap between our ability to conceive of something and our ability to do it is uh, creating kind of a, a developmental injunction for us. It's, it's forcing us to um, reckon with our own impulses and our own desires. So like, how do you, how do you see us making sense of this? If you look at the logarithmic spiral of the rate of change, uh, that hominization took millions of years, and el the electronic planetization occurs in, you know, years. Uh, just a few years ago, there was no World Wide Web. Um, we're the first uh, species in which the rate of change is, in is visible in an individual lifetime. So selfhood takes on a whole different dimension or phase space. So what you see in all the things you're describing are variations of selfhood. On the one hand, you have the victim model that uh, we're basically human sacrifice. And if you look at, say, celebrities are like a caricature of the formation of the Renaissance self. Hey, look at me, I'm famous. You know, they interview teenage kids in the hood and they'll say, what are you going to be when you grow up? I'm going to be somebody. I'm going to be famous. They, they don't say, I'm going to be Madame Curie or I'm going to, you know, be Bach. I'm going to be a celebrity. That's all they want. Uh, so celebrities are a uh, victim, human sacrifice uh, in an electronic culture because, you know, you lose your life. You know, you have to have your own secret service to protect yourself from the crazies who want to, you know, I shot Andy Warhol kind of thing. Uh, so uh, I, you know, all chose very early on in my career not to become a celebrity. So I said no to television and uh, no to all that stuff because I could see that people like Marshall McLuhan and Bucky Fuller, when I was lecturing with them, uh, had lost control of their lives. They had become victim of the media. And you would think McLuhan would be, you know, smart enough to avoid it since he was a student of media. But he was basically kind of high-level autistic, uh, Asperger's syndrome kind of guy. Um, so he became a victim, so I thought, and Alan Watts did too, from the counterculture point of view. So I looked at these three guys, and I said, I don't want to grow up like that. So I decided to take the strategy of hiding, that I would work on a life's work of an oeuvre, but not go on David Frost or Dick Cavett, all these things that I was invited to you know, participate in when, when my book was was hot. And what happens then is you disappear from the culture as a kind of influential voice. Your books don't sell. You, you pay a big price in royalties. That's why most of these guys go on book tours and, you know, pump up their books and stuff just to economically survive. Or you become a professor and, you, you know, you have a salary and you don't have to worry about it. But I, that wasn't my uh, way either. So I use the opposite strategy of working with the IntelliKey of through yoga practice developing this sensitivity to angelic and elemental realms and working on philosophically on a, a what McLuhan would call a cultural retrieval of animism and trying to understand it both from its comic book formations and pop culture and its historical roots in uh, in Celtic animism, from my own tradition, obviously, animism is also Shinto in Japan and other cultures. But um, the hybrid singularity university is working on the technological interface. Now, I'm Skyping with you, so I'm obviously not like my friend Wendell Berry, a Luddite. He won't have any 
uh, electronic technology uh, in the house. I think he's got a television, but uh, and he has a pickup and a telephone, but he won't take any of the new technologies. And uh, I've accepted and learned how to use, you know, email and Skype and, you know, I don't like Facebook very well, but I'm on Facebook, but I'm restricted to, you know, only the people I know. I don't take, you know, I don't want to have 6,000 friends. I mean, that's, that's obscene. I have, so, I have an obscene number of friends. Different strategies. So mine is when, let's say there is a transitional event, the singularity becomes a historical event in 20, 30 or something. Let's take Kurt Files prophecy. Um, I'm riding the kind of surf, surfing this wave of history. Uh, other people feel they've been, you know, ditched into the abyss uh, and they've fallen off, or others have this victim consciousness and feel engulfed. Um, and through radical solitude and uh, turning off the television and having silence um, as something that no longer exists in the culture, Everywhere you go, there's piped in crappy music or even rock music is no longer creative the way it was when I, you know, I mean, every old man says this, but I think it's too invented <laughs> that, you know, it was pretty awesome with the Rolling Stones in the 60s and, and the creativity of all these different groups. No, it's just a bubblegum product well, that keeps turning out the same kind of style. They had real shadow, the Rolling Stones. They had real shadow. They were they were uh, legitimately confronting their darkness. Yeah, yeah, like that Altamont movie that showed that with the murder. But uh, they were never my favorite group. But uh, some of their, you know, like their, their messianic song, "We are waiting, we are waiting for something to come out of somewhere," is part of this whole Roswell. Uh, imagination, so it's kind of interesting to see how they pick up on that. But uh, in choosing, you know, silence and radical uh, solitude uh, and unplugging from the celebrity system, my way of relating to this is, is quite different from, say, uh, Kurzweil or any other guy who wants as, as hungry for as much attention as they can get. And they feel that if they're not perceived to the media, they don't exist. And uh, Bucky Fuller was like that. When we were lecturing this years ago, um, on city planning for the future of the city of Tallahassee in Florida, there was some conference, I forget who funded it. And uh, the first thing that Bucky would do in the hotel in the morning is run to get the morning newspapers to see if he made the front page. <laughs> and then we'd be sitting after the lectures in the bar having a drink. I used to drink then. Uh, and he would say, excuse me, and he would run to the afternoon, the evening news to see if he made the six o'clock local news. And he, uh, he was intensely concerned with how he was perceived and had this kind of Norman Mailer attitude that if, I, if I'm not perceived, I don't exist. And that was surprising for such a creative guy. Uh, but, you know, he was obviously made big contributions to the whole big mix. But, uh, but that was how he related to electronic society. So I think there are, you know, some other people working in, in silence and radical solitude who are developing this kind of IntelliKey approach. I don't know of anybody. Uh, this may be unique to me. I hope not. But, but um, it's quite different from the, the hybrid university, uh, singularity university approach. And, uh, you know, your approach uh, with using art and music and science, you know, is a, is a different one. So uh, there's a range of, um, you know, from hysterical fundamentalism to creative arts and imagination. You know, during the Renaissance in Florence, it was unsafe to walk the streets, you know, the reason they had the Uffizi Gallery on, on the third floor and walked in and closed things. Is if the you know if they walked the streets, there would be an assassin. You know, they tried to kill, you know, Lorenzo de' Medici in church in mass on a Sunday. You know, so uh, Renaissance Europe was extremely violent and unstable. At the same time, it was intensely creative.
I think we'll be remembered as fondly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah we, we seem to be pretty destructive as a culture. But I, I have the feeling America ecologically is going to have their, their shit hit the fan, and there's just going to be big earthquakes and big hurricanes taking out Houston or, or New Orleans or Miami, or even New York. We came close you know, to getting hit um, this, uh, this summer. I've been on the path of two hurricanes. But I, uh, you know, I have a kind of shamanic response to hurricanes and so work at a more elemental level. Do you, do you, do you see, uh, there's this whole kind of, uh, you're familiar with Richard Tarnas and his whole, yeah, you know, the cosmos and psyche. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that whole issue of um, astrology. Yeah, astrology, but it, astrology understood through uh, you know, Carl Jung, synchronicity, depth psychology. And the idea that, the idea, not that we're so much bringing this upon ourselves, but in some sense, it's this kind of uh, self fulfilling prophecy that we. Uh, this is my videographer. Oh, your video, I see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is a momentous occasion for people of, of my, uh, my immediate peer group. This is, um, we've all been. We've all been. That's such a momentous occasion. Right? A singularity. Or... Oh no! This this interview is kind of a singularity in the sense that uh, that. No, no, that's my. Kind of <laughs> well, the, the, one of the characteristics of the singularity is that it's over. It's always overhyped, right? Yeah. That... Um, so yeah, like it, part of a, you know, my me and my group of friends, you know, are really interested in, in um, the performance of this, the multimedia. Uh, you know, the exploration of different cultural spaces opened up by this this newer unity. You know, in the same way that you have a, a that the evolution of uh, you know organic macromolecules proceeded very slowly until they were within the uh, the organizing creative unit of a cell. You know, it's like suddenly we have this. I'm not. I mean, in full recognition of the fact that we are destroying cultures left and right and diversity left and right. Uh, right now, through this uh, homogenization of you know globalism, there seems it seems to be again this sort of uh, preliminary, um, like Charles Eisenstein said, it's like weeds filling a parking lot, and that's the primary ecology. And then as soon as it's grown as much as it can, it's it's enriched the soil for this new and much more mature and stable Imagine ecosystem. Yeah. So in uh, imaginary landscape. Uh, I say we slay with technology and then save the victim with art. So in Ice Age culture, they, they killed the, the cave bear, and then they put they made a cave altar and put the jaw of the skull of the cave on this altar, and the shaman would take on literally the skin of the, uh, of the animal and paint the Chauvet cave, and so that was saving the victim with art. So the brain... Uh, and intelligence is becoming the victim in American culture as we dumb it down, dumb it down, dumb it down. And at the same time, we're creating you know, artificial intelligence and hybrid technologies and, and creating art forms that are uh, not just paint on canvas, but are mixed media that combine you know, various things. For the most part, they tend to, I think, trivialize by taking things out of context, like if you took this interview and you spliced it up into little snippets and you made kind of like a mix and flashed it on a big screen and everybody took ecstasy and or something, that, that would be, you know, uh, typically American crap. Well, and it, that's, that's very much, that's, that's very much the, uh, the terrain that, that we're, that the people I know are really trying to like conscientiously navigate here because we are basically, all of us grew up in remix culture. And very few of us are, uh, you know, carrying around this idea that we're ever going to be able to create anything completely new. Um, but at the same time, we've, we've taken a perspective on the immersive environment and like installation art, the kind of which you were describing is pretty much um, my media ecosystem, you know, where you have a concert, but it's not just a concert anymore. It's it's interactive, you know, electronic arts installations and live painters and dancers. I, I would be a kind of stand-up intellectual and I would 
lecture without notes and make a kind of synthesis and use words. Uh, and the, I would say something to the word and I would use it like a sonar echo to get a, the tone from the audience that I was talking to, kind of like where their collective astral body was. And then I would start uh, it relating to that uh, body and, and um, riffing on various kinds of things. Uh, coming into being is basically a series of riffs that I gave at the cathedral at the Lindisfarne Symposium. But I did it all by just talking. Uh, you know, it was all wall to wall words. It was the Irish Bardic Celtic tradition. And it wasn't with, uh, you know, mixed media or things of that sort. But experimented with it with electronic stained glass. Right. My altar at the cathedral. But it turned out to be really, I think, shallow. It was just a kaleidoscope. Um, it had no, no real content from my point of view. But these new technologies are kind of allergic to content. Um, they really, you know, the medium is the message, as Marshall said. But well, here's the here's the for me the. I want to finish your yeah. Time, Rick, before you go on another thing. Yeah. Um, I don't. Uh, I I wasn't impressed with Rick as an astrologer. I've met other young astrologers that I think are just better as astrologers. But I think the whole aspect of Jung and all of that is, is looking in the rearview mirror. It's inherently very, very old-fashioned, the late development of 19th century Romanticism, flirting as Jung did with fascism, uh, as the whole Germanic culture did with, you know, with Hitler. Um, but I don't think that's uh, the wave of the future. I think that's really a very reactionary imagination. It's sort of like Gary Snyder and the Paleolithic and Wendell Berry and in the 19th century patriarchal American farm. So you don't see it as a, uh, a kind of a fulfillment of this Copernican movement to decentralize the things that we consider to be uh, like uh, to have some sort of anthropic priority that that like we we got our, ourselves out of the center of the solar system. But we're st all of the meaning is still encapsulated in the human head. And you don't see this as a movement. Precisely is that. Young turns the unconscious into the suburbs. I mean, it's just, you know, the unconscious gets reified as a place. And uh, he has this kind of very intensive patriarchal narrative. And everything, you know, when you talk to some Jungians, they'll say, oh, I'm so in touch with my Dionysian nature, I can cut off heads. You know, and I mean, it just gets really suburban. Uh, shopping mall consumerism. I, I don't think it's going anywhere. Mm. Uh, but that's just me. Mm. I'm very skeptical. Of <laughs> I didn't like CIS, so I, you know, fled to. Uh, <laughs> it's a better place now than it was in the 90s, but I, uh, I went, you know, running back to New York and said, God, God give me Manhattan over San Francisco any day. They're still with tie dye and the Haight Ashbury and still taking acid and you know it, it's like a theme park out there very much i was just there two days ago showing some friends around the theme park of ashbury do you know a, a, a guy a young guy named uh, siegel seagal he's a grad student at cis no yeah uh, he's into my uh, my writings uh, and whitehead and stuff oh. really interesting kid very young like 22 or something yeah. i'll look him up well, this your, your skepticism. I want to I want to loop back around to this real quickly, and I don't want to I don't want to keep you all day, um, but um, unless you're into it. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I guess really the way I want to end this is is looking at your work with Lindisfarne and like me and and uh, my colleagues and the way that we're trying to like to follow that as an exemplary or like a formative text here because. Something that, you know, you talk about the, this new media, this uh, kind of m mishmashed or really kind of like a bricolage method of combining all of these different streams as being allergic to input. But it seems like there's a sense in which uh, each of these different performance media in an immersive environment could be understood as a, you know, a separate sensory pathway. And then you have that, that delay space. You know that you have you have an an emergent selfhood that comes from those, and so like 
you know, being as it is that you you just did another meeting with Lindisfarne this fall, how do you feel that it's um? Let's see. <sighs> How do you feel that it succeeded uh, in, in some way in informing uh, a next generation of like multimedia performances of a planetary culture? Well, I don't know about the multimedia so much um, because your generation is, uh, is a separate one from, say, the generation of my son, who is now middle-aged. Um, we certainly influenced, you know... Uh, the Misa Gaia from Paul Winter was inspired by, you know, the meetings with Lynn and Jim. Uh, and so his whole solstice concerts that occur at the cathedral for 10,000 people, you know, and have been going for like 20, 30 years, that certainly uh, had an impact on a lot of people. Uh, the uh, emergence of complex dynamical systems with the interactions between Lynn and Jim and Francisco Varela and Ralph Abraham certainly uh, helped take it to a new level. The influence of uh, John Todd and Sim Vandrine on David Orr and the founding of the program in environmental studies at uh, Oberlin and the green program and the uh, green architecture of Oberlin. And David is working uh, with the mayor of uh, Cincinnati to try to create uh, a carbon, you know, free footprint for the city uh, or low carbon footprint. So that's had some impact. Uh, Jerry Brown used to come to, you know, some of our meetings in California. And so a few ideas have filtered into his imagination. So I think, uh, you know, the relationship between Buddhism and cognitive science that's going on with the Dalai Lama that, you know, Lindisfarne did that in the 70s. Uh, with Varela and Machen Rinpoche and Bob Thurman, and Evan was uh, just a, at high school age, uh, but he was sitting in on all the classes, and now he works directly with the Dalai Lama. Uh, my son is a professor, full professor at the U University of Toronto and works with the Dalai Lama on their Mind Life program. Arthur Zions, who uh, is now the president of the Mind Life Foundation, uh, you know, came to Lindisfarne meetings as a young assistant professor of, of physics at Amherst. So, and Jane Hirschfield, the poet, used to, you know, <laughs> come to sit in uh, when the Zen master would allow her uh, to the meetings in San Francisco Zen Center. So there had been this kind of radiation out of these conversations that certainly affected Lynn's imagination, and she changed her narratives to include autopoiesis from the 1981 meeting of Lindisfarne. Uh, so I think on the model of, you know, Pythagoras' school or Cosimo de' Medici's uh, academy in Renaissance Florence uh, or Bauhaus as a collection of uh, creative people, that Lindisfarne's been in that classic model of uh, a collection of creative people in small living room conversations that does not get commercialized or turned into TED Talks, <laughs> celebrity approach. Ours are always small, intimate living room conversations. Uh, I've always been trying to work on using it to articulate a post-religious spirituality and the kind of art form that I call Wissenskunst. Uh, and so I am, like you, interested in new genres and trying to bring various things um, together. So I work both in the written genre of the essay and poetry, but also the, the oral tradition of the, the bardic, the talk as a, you know, uh, David Ulansi, when I was at CIS, uh, said, and it was kind of, I couldn't tell whether it was a compliment or an insult, but uh, I think it was a little bit of both. Um, David's a sweet guy. He, he's written a book on the myth ray at Mysteries. Um, he said, Thompson isn't a teacher, he's a performance artist. <laughs> so uh, the um, the students who wanted to have Ken Wilbur and have textbooks really got pissed off at me because they would say, Thompson doesn't teach us, he just shows us how smart he is. Uh, he mentioned all these books like Fitting His Weight, and so I was in California like disempowering them by mentioning all these books they hadn't read, uh, which is the opposite approach to, you know, how it works at MIT or Cambridge. You get a bunch of geniuses together in a room, 
surrounded with some grad students and let the sparks fly. You know, that the way you teach in really creative groups is not this digested uh, roadmap kind of thing of Ken Wilber, but it's having, you know, Wittgenstein and Bertrand Russell in the same room, you know? Well, I studied, I studied under Ken for a couple of years. Um, and, uh, well, what, what came of it was, um, an appreciation for how he, you know, when I came upon your work, you were really showing, you were explaining these, this, uh, the human condition in a, you know, a much more embedded and collaborative fashion, as opposed to, you know, telling this story that's, you know, essentially the same kind of heroic ascent you know, where we're this increasing differentiation from nature. There was no, there's no planetary bioplasm in that work. Ultimately, that, that was my, um, you know. It, well, there's it, no it, sense of humor. There's no sense of spontaneity. There's no sense of the feminine. Um, he loved maps and, and, and he's kind of like a control freak. And also, because he's an autodidact, he doesn't understand academic scholarship because you know that quadrant, you know, that he keeps using? That's a complete plagiarism from the quadrant from at the edge of history. I mean, get the book and look at the back, and you'll see, you know. And what does he say in, in uh, every, um, you know, Ken Wilber explains everything. He interviews himself, which is narcissism to the ultimate degree. And then he asks himself, well, how did you come up with the four quadrants approach? And he said, well... Ken, that's kind of interesting that you would ask that because, you know, I noticed that nobody was talking about, and what do you mean nobody was talking about? The book was nominated for the National Book Award, for God's sake, it was the final one. And here he is ripping it off without a footnote. I mean, no, no, no legitimate professor would ever, you know, do that. He does it because he's always talking down to his disciples, and he runs a little mini cult. I mean, it's just... He represents everything I don't want to be. There's definitely not the sense in which the integral institute is the same kind of temporary autonomous zone with Lindisfarne, where it's it's acknowledging its its liminality and its its uh, the sort of intertidal thing. Whereas it seemed like there was a there was an attempt with the Ken, Ken's whole project to create a new center rather than a new nexus of fringes. I don't know. It's, but you know, when I'm seeing him on YouTube and stuff, he's in a chair and he's always talking down to his audience. They are asking the great master questions. You notice in this interview, I've been listening to you as much as I've been talking. I appreciate that. So I bet, but I found out about as much about you as you know about me. That's called a conversation. So what do you think? Um, where do you think the conversation can go once this one is is over in terms of in terms of um, like what would be your I'm going to put you up on the chair for a minute here and and just ask what do you see as the lessons of, you know, at this point, 40 years with Lindisfarne for people who are who are attempting to self-organize their own collaborative multidisciplinary performances of a planetary civilization culture. I think if you get a group of creatives, uh, creative folk in different disciplines from music science, uh, get some scientists who might have inventions and maybe musicians who might have royalties for you know, albums or whatever, and have them tied uh, from their collective earnings to support the group because I was always a beggar and having to go to rich people or foundations and get money. So Lindisfarne went broke every year and died for 25 years. And uh, that kind of patronage model, you know, like the Medici supporting uh, the Pacino's Academy, uh, certainly the Lawrence Rockefeller as an individual spent, you know, a lot of money on Lindisfarne over the years, but we were never independent and never endowed. So make, uh, develop an economy that's, uh, that's self-sustaining, not just self-organizing. Uh, most of the Lindisfarne fellow types, uh, except yours truly, 
have gone back to university, like John Todd and New Alchemy. Uh, he went back to the Institute for Natural Resources at the University of Vermont. Uh, David Orr project Metal Creek didn't work out, so it collapsed, and he went back to becoming dean of environmental studies. And this had more impact on the culture doing that than it had with Meadow Creek. Sim Van Ryn gave up on the Farallones Institute and basically went to becoming a, a practicing architect and uh, back at adjunct faculty at Berkeley. And my son, who grew up homeschooled at Lindisfarne and never went to junior high or high school, uh, uh, went back to university and is a uh, you know, doing cognitive science and Buddhist and Asian philosophy at the University of Toronto, which is the largest philosophy department in North America. And my daughter is a professor of English literature at Bowdoin College. So they saw me going broke um, and uh, being strapped for money uh, all the time and decided that the individual institution, uh, the alternative institution, uh, was very much a, a feature of the 70s, but it's not viable in this uh, 21st century. <laughs> so if you don't have a patron the way Biosphere 2 and Oracle Arizona have the Bass Brothers as uh, super rich guys writing a check for the whole thing, uh, it now belongs to Columbia University, uh, then, uh, then get yourself a group of uh, people who are uh, can produce wealth and not just uh, a group of patrons. Because the patrons, uh, patronage is like a love affair, you know, it'll last about three years, they, they, they like you, and then they get bored and they want a new girlfriend. Oh. So patronage is not a good cycle. Well, patronage, a patron would be like a priest for the human sacrifice of a, an artistic celebrity, right? So like if we're if we're going to, to perform a planetary civilization, we need a, a metabolic economy. We need to actually generate our own. And then so then that that would bring us around to this notion that um, we're attempting to reconcile our own like global oxygenation event with all of the uh, the refuse and waste of an information economy. So all we need to do for the next Lindisfarne then I guess would be to figure out how to turn spam into other people's junk mail into our uh, glucose. Yeah. Yeah. Figure what your structure is and what its shadow form is and find a way to make the pollution you generate or the shadow you create uh, recycled into the uh, creative mix. Uh, but definitely the problem is one has to solve the problem of money and finance. You know, Ken, um, his wife is a friend of mine, Trey up. Uh, she used to be called Terry Killam. She had a lot of inherited Texas oil money, and she basically, you know, bankrolled him. So he, he could, you know, he was protected from peer review and from economic testing of reality, so he could do his own private thing because he had his own private income. Hmm. Well, rather than, rather than end it on that note, <laughs> let's... What, yeah, let's uh, let's say what do you, what would be the, the 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 single piece of advice for a, a planetary civilization about to enter a technocultural bardo, where our own neuroses are manifesting themselves instantaneously before us. I would say corks float where battleships sink in turbulent seas. So. <laughs> Develop your inner skills and attune, you know, to these different realms that I call the IntelliKey, and uh, uh, you'll probably uh, unconsciously end up where you're supposed to be, and uh, you don't have to be victimized by the transformational process. You can, you know, uh, use it to, uh, you know, enter into a different, uh, you know the way a volcano explodes and then creates rich soil and, you know, sooner down the line you get Hawaii and, you know, rich Hawaiian Kona coffee and, and so the, the uh, explosion of the catastrophic event can actually be 
enriching both of the soil and the atmosphere. So I think it's a question of not trying what Gregory Basin called conscious purpose, not trying to consciously master everything, control it and finesse it. And you know the, the metaphor for that is there was this couple from Europe who wanted to in the 30s to escape the coming crisis of you know World War II. So they decided to escape civilization and go to a desert island. Unfortunately, the desert island they chose was uh, Iwo Jima. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's like Oedipus Rex. It's a metaphor of conscious control and thinking you're in charge is, is not the best way. The, uh, the Taoist way of, uh, you know, Wei Wu Wei in Chinese uh, will probably be the survival skill we we need for your your event. I don't intend to be around. Uh, <laughs> that's, your, that's your challenge. All right. Well, what are you to do with all this stuff? Uh, uh, is this for a magazine, or is this just for you, or what? This is. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna transcribe this. We're gonna publish if we can. We're gonna publish the the raw video, um, and it's gonna go up um, at least. On Renaissance Project, therenaissanceproject.com, and uh, hopefully also the uh, hybrid reality blog at bigthink.com, which is yeah. yeah. They, I'm on their mailing list. Yeah. We're really subscribed, and they never uh, ask me questions. Anymore. Yeah, they they need they need someone to uh, come at this. They need someone who's coming at this from a, a different angle than Michio Kaku. So that's what I'm hoping we can do with it. But they're like TED Talks. They're definitely celebrity oriented. I mean, they're they're big time academics that they generally have on the big think. Well, yeah. Unfortunately, uh, everyone does get their fifteen minutes of fame, regardless <laughs> whether or not you have a television. You're on one somewhere. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had my fifteen minutes back in 1972. So, <laughs> you know, I passed that cycle. All right. Well, thank you, Bill. Take care of yourself. Yeah.